Hey everyone, welcome to the podcast. Uh, talk about business and AI. Uh, you know me and Joe. I'm joined by uh, Amon Virgi and Dave McClure. Uh, they both work for Practical VC. They've invested in some fantastic companies from Canva, Credit Karma, Twilio, SendGrid, Lyft, Udemy, uh, GitLab, Reddit, Stripe, and more. Basically everything I use. So they are here to talk to us. And so thank you both for joining. I appreciate it. Thank you. Thanks for having good, us. To, uh, yeah. good to see you again. Thanks for having Oh, anytime. By the way, you have to do the, the tagline, practical venture capital, because it isn't. <laughs> nice. I was that's, not aware of that tagline. Supposed to be supposed to be a joke, but although it's not really yep. a joke, it's, right. it's true that it is not very practical. Yep. We're trying to make it more practical. We are trying to make it more right, practical. On. Take yes. us away, man. We're going to goof around the whole hour. Yes. All right. So... Um, I've prepared a couple of slides just that, that talk a bit about the current environment for venture, um, what we're seeing in terms of the, just the, the broader backdrop, where we are, where we think we are in the cycle, some of the interesting opportunities we're seeing in the next year and where we're investing. Um, if you scoot ahead one, one page, let me just share with you the, uh, this chart that I keep track of. It just, it's for round sizes for Series I'm, A I'm on, and earlier companies. Before you dive into the weeds. Before you dive into the weeds, yeah. is 2024 going to be a Go good ahead. or bad year for entrepreneurs and for VCs? And those might be two different. What an answers. original question. What an You're original question. No, it's not. Yeah, I think it's going to be. Uh, you're, you're asking for the, what the future holds, the crystal ball look. Mm -hmm. I'm just giving um, the, I think it's going to be the 10 second answer first and then dive into all the, the math. Yeah, I think it's I think it's still going to be tough. I think it'll be better than 2023, but I think it's still going to be a uh, a tough year for both entrepreneurs and VCs. I think for both entrepreneurs and VCs, yes. I think it's just a tougher investment climate, which means it's tough to navigate, especially if you haven't done it before. I think it's going to be a tough. What, what about tough for, for what about for VCs that invest in secondary, Amon? Ah, uh, well. If, if you have, I think, if you're able to deploy capital, so I think the good news about 2024 is the valuations are a lot more reasonable than uh, what you've seen in the past three years. So if you're deploying capital, this is actually a great time to be invested in great companies. And if you are, the challenge is you got to be able to raise money and deploy capital in this environment, which is, you know, that's, that's the hard part. But for investors in this space, especially if you have a, an angle or a niche, this is, I think this shapes up to be a really good vintage. All right. What do you think? Do you have a do you have, a, do you have a, an opinion on twenty twenty four? I think it's a great time to be investing in later stage companies because those valuations are more reasonable, uh, and I think the IPO market will come back in the next six to twelve months at least. Um, early stage, I think, kind of jury's still out, and I don't think we've seen a pullback in valuations on early stage companies that much yet. A little bit, but probably not as much as I would like. Although we're not active in that side of it. Um, but yeah, I think we're still, everybody's reacting to, you know, the difference between now and two years ago. I think people should be comparing now to like five or six years ago. And I still think seed stage startups today are more expensive than five or six years ago. Two questions, Dave. Uh, one, do you think late stage has a better value because they now have a business model and you can actually do some cash, you can do some predictions on what their cash flows are going to be. And so you can't have these ridiculous valuations on hope and prayers. <laughs> and second, why do you think the angel and the A rounds are expensive? Uh, well, I certainly think you have a better chance of buying fair value at later stage because you do have more visibility underlying metrics and, you know, I, I also think the public markets are more rationally valued now as well. Uh, early stage, you know, everything is possible at early stage. So it's all rainbows and unicorns, <laughs> maybe not quite as many unicorns now. Um, and so even if there has been, you know, a, a reduced valuation environment, uh, people are still five to seven years or longer away from, you know, the eventual IPO target day. And so people can wax uh, whimsical about what things are worth and what their possibilities are. Um, as to why those numbers are still staying high, I think a lot of later stage investors retreated to earlier stage investments, whether rightly or wrongly, um, possibly so that you know their investors weren't second guessing them about their deployment of capital so quickly. <laughs> but I, I have a feeling we will see a pull back a little bit in 
the later stage investors, early stage deployment of capital. Um, but but that may not be correct. I mean, there's a lot of large VC firms that have now raised uh, substantial uh, seed stage capital. Uh, I think Lightspeed, Lightspeed has a dedicated seed fund. Andreessen has a dedicated seed fund. Sequoia and others have been doing it through scout funds forever. So there's there's a lot of institutional capital happening at seed, uh, not just from micro VCs, but from all kinds of folks. And so I, I don't know if I have a full analysis on why that's been maybe more resistant to valuation, you know, rationality, but certainly the people in later stage, you know, they see the valuations being reduced in the public markets. They maybe only have three years, you know, sort of target three to five year target to get to liquidity. So their valuations have to be more connected to reality. Uh, and they do have, you know, numbers to look at if maybe not profitable uh, yet, but they shouldn't have revenue to look at. Uh, with early stage, it's all guesswork. Dave, Dave that makes sense because they can early stage, they can kind of grow into their valuation. So you can kind of get well, if you're an idiot at loosey -loosey. early stage, it takes longer to figure out that you're an idiot. <laughs> late stage, <laughs> that's, late stage that's if you're being an short. idiot, you have a short timeline to see that. You're like, oh, yeah, you're an idiot. Early stage, like, huh, are they an idiot? I'm not sure yet. <laughs> Give it a few years. I, that's cool. Uh, yeah. Well, well done. Um, I'm, I'm on. Um, so median series A rounds in the millions. Let's, can you break this, this graph down? Yeah, that's all a good. It's a good segue into this stage conversation. So let's just look at the Series A companies. What we what we we pull this data from PitchBook and a couple of sources, and this is the size of a round that gets done in the U.S. for a for a A round company. The blue line charts the round size over time. These little orange bars are what happens if you have a, a Nasdaq. Correction. Sorry, give me. Oh, sorry, I'm sorry. Oh, I apologize. Uh, Dave is a wonderful typer and i love it uh <laughs> dave mute yourself real quick if you could buddy uh oh, and then uh, go to a mod no you don't have to apologize because our production person was like jordan stop fucking going through the research papers i can hear your research papers and you're constantly slamming your coffee down so dave i'm glad you were doing something so my production person's now like okay jordan you. yeah yeah so Amon, go for it sorry about that sir okay no problem so the the chart shows the blue line the blue line charts the average size of a median Series A company. And this goes back to about 2012, 2013. So you can see the blue line generally has been going up, going up, going up. Those red bars are where you have a, a NASDAQ stock market correction. So stock market drops by 20% or more. So you can hey, see Mark, what happens to the blue line in general. There are, blue line yeah. is the round size, not the company valuation, correct? That's right. That's the round size, correct. Okay. The valuation gets a little bit tricky to track because not every company reports a valuation, first of sure. all. And then it gets very cluttered by things like safes and preference opportunities. And the la it's, it's, there is data available on, on um, valuations, but we, I find the round size to be a bit more predictive of where these companies are really at. And you can see every time there's a NASDAQ correction, that blue line kind of wavers just a little bit. You know, it sort of stops in its, in its rise. It doesn't really correct very much or takes a, a little bit of a, a lag to correct. In this last NASDAQ correction, there was definitely a drop in the blue line. But to Dave's point earlier, like it's only dropped about 14% from top to bottom to kind of where we are now. There's been a little bit of a recovery in the last couple of quarters. So there's been something of a, a correction, but not, you know, not we near the size one of the correction ahead, in but... the public market. Yeah. Go to the next page, Jordan. This is the and... D and beyond. And you can see the same, the same chart, the same data, round sizes. Again, mapped against these the the corrections that are happening in these different in these different buckets, right. and you can see the first of all the blue line has had generally speaking an up up to the right. It definitely took off in the last three years, 2020, 21, 22. It's down 52 percent from top to bottom, so a much larger correction from from where we saw the peak. We're kind of back to 2017, 2018 levels of, of valuation and round sizes. Um, the companies generally are bigger than they were then. They're growing just as quickly. They're, they're better in terms of their profitability. Um, we've seen a lot of advances in technology, I think between cloud software, um, AI now, just the development of technology has been a lot richer. The TAMs are bigger. And yet the valuations are almost back to where they were like four or five, six years ago. Got a quick uh, question. Uh, yeah. This is, first of all, like sweep the leg, no mercy. That, that's our show parlance for like great presentation, great information. I'm smarter karate now, kid. so thank you. Karate, karate, karate kid, okay. hell yeah, bro. We got it. Wait, wait, there's, one, there's one more best. shoe that hasn't dropped yet. He's he's also going to talk about what actually happened in the public markets for SaaS companies. So 
We should. I don't know if you have a slide for that. Well, or not, I, but. That's okay. What, we're gonna, what David talked about that, but also for noobs is my understanding. Round size, basically. Amon has a startup called Huli, and he goes to us three and says, "I want to raise, <laughs> want to raise a hundred million dollars." And so that is what the round size is, right? And the valuation would be if he wanted to raise a hundred million dollars for fifty percent of his company, then the valuation of all the shares would be two hundred million dollars. Is that is that correct? Yeah, I'm yeah, trying to raise. Typically, like 10, people a, are <laughs> diluting by twenty yeah. percent. I think is probably yep. more common. Yeah. Gotcha. Yeah. I, 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 if it was Joe asking that question, he was like 13, 15 percent because he does math. I'm an idiot, so I just go by 50 percent. <laughs> yeah, I wouldn't, I wouldn't dilute 50 percent in a, uh, you know, Series C, Series D, no matter how sweet talking the investor is. But typically, these rounds are like 10 percent of the company, 15 percent of the company. Um, the valuations may or may not get disclosed. Sometimes the valuation is set at some very high number, but there's like a bunch of terms in there, like. I'll, I'll give you the valuation you want, but you know, if the company doesn't do well, I get extra stock. I get downside mm. protection. I get to buy you out at some preferable share. Um, I get two board seats. I get to fire your whole team and put in my team. So all that stuff kind of gets, that noise kind of gets into the, the valuation that gets published. Um, so you look at round size. Round size, how much did you really give me, right? Five years ago, I was getting $20 million. Today, I'm getting $20 million. A year ago, I was getting $30 million. Like all else being equal, I'm just getting a lot less money right now for for my company. So this sort of tells you in the later stages of the game, there's been a huge reduction in round sizes. Earlier to Dave's point before, I'm not sure we've seen, you know, much or any real reduction from the peak. The the market still seems to be robust, deals are getting done, the valuations seem high. It seems like the bubble hasn't really burst in that early stage yet. Some of that is yeah. AI, you know, if there's a story tell around a hot category that begins to inflate things. But it's harder to hide when you're in these later stages, and that's that's where I think it's uh, there's just better yeah. deals for investors. I think maybe just to add a little bit more color there, there's there's a lot of things that Amon mentioned there. Um, some of them are recent trends, some of them are longer term trends. Um, you know, we're looking at numbers over maybe a roughly ten year period. Um, so, kind of if you were trying to think about this, I think it would be uh, helpful to understand what's happened in the public markets in that last 10 years, what's happened in private markets in the last 10 years. Uh, another factor that might have to do with round size has been, there's been a generally large amount of growth in venture capital firms and funds. And so possibly not connected to the rest of the market conditions is just the fact that VCs have more money to deploy and they're typically not increasing portfolio size, although their fund size is increasing. Mm. So that might be another reason that you've seen mm. Uh, round sizes creep up over the years that isn't necessarily correlated to the market. Um, but if you were trying to mm -hmm. think about, you know, one thing that's going on, what I would probably say is, hey, has the relative exit size in the public markets increased as much as the round size and the valuations have increased in the private markets? Um, certainly one thing that Amon was mentioning is that in the last two or three years, we've seen a dramatic reduction in the revenue multiple for companies going public. Um, so, you know, Maybe three years ago, certainly two years ago, we were at the height of that market uh, and companies were, were probably being valued in public markets at 20x a month, 18x maybe median SaaS. Yep. Which would be with the peak, yep. And today it's around 7x maybe, is that correct? Seven or eight? Yep. Exactly. Fast growth yep. companies might be a little bit higher, but not dramatically higher, right? And and I think if we, I don't know if you again have these slides, Amon, but I know in other slides you've talked about them before, you know, median range SaaS public company multiples, probably in the six to 10X range over the last 10 years, not not so much in the last three or four, but in the longer term time frame, right? Yeah, that's exactly right. Uh, I can I can share these slides, I don't have them here, but I can share them separately. I've got a, uh, we, we track this on a quarterly basis. And the, I think as a Q4, that that SaaS multiple in the public markets was about seven, on on average. The highest it ever got to was eighteen at the at the end of kind of Q one twenty one, and Q four twenty one it was like eighteen. So the multiples have basically been cut in half since since the or peak, more than which, half, which does look a lot. Which thing? Wow. Yeah, yeah more than half yeah. actually. And and to think about yeah. that a little bit more is fast growth company multiples have gotten cut more, right? So fast growth companies were mm -hmm. inflated more during the ZERP period. Now they're deflated more, at least on a relative basis. And so if you look at public companies, uh, you know, premier public companies in, in SaaS, uh, I'm sort of familiar with Twilio, but, you know, choose your public SaaS company. They've dropped 70 or 80% in value over the last, you know, two or three years. Um, 
but but Wait. in general, when you're thinking about wow. sort of what, yeah, I know it's pretty pretty uh, harsh. Um, so I, I think a lot of things that people are trying to figure out in venture is what's a reasonable public market valuation for a reasonable growth SaaS company, and then on a relative basis, how much should I be pricing earlier private round valuations at, given some reasonable estimates of growth? And and usually private companies are valued at a higher multiple than public markets. And the faster they're growing, perhaps even the higher those multiples could be. But, you know, where we were seeing 40, 50 X, maybe even 100 X revenue multiples for private company valuations a couple of years ago. Now, we're probably not seeing that anymore. Uh, maybe for AI companies, we're probably seeing more in the 15 to 20 times, you know, maybe for fast growth companies, it might be more than 20, but probably not much more than 20. Um, and maybe for less, you know, amazing companies, you know, closer, maybe not all the way, but closer to the public market, you know, comps. Um, so the earlier you go in uh, stage and valuation, the more out of whack you could possibly get from the public market numbers, but the closer you are to late stage valuation, potentially getting to public, the more your number of valuations have to sort of start to look like what they're going to look like when those companies go public. Mm. So as we were talking about before, less time to realize whether you're an idiot or not. You know, this is completely well said. And for the noobs like myself, I look at these multiples, and this is just a rough approximation, kind of like price to earnings ratios in the stock market, where people might yep. see a fast growing company, and they'll say, I'll give it a 60 PE, because I think this company is going to grow and make more money and the profits will increase. And then you see something like plain Jane, Again, like you're talking Parker about Gamble. And you... PE ratios, where there is a P. <laughs> for a lot of mm -hmm. yep. for right. a lot of yep. uh, private companies, Trust. there is no P. <laughs> it's revenue, not profit. Yeah, was, yep. when, profit? What's that? <laughs> well, sometimes right. no revenue. So we're not we're not talking about sixty yeah. x PE multiples. We are talking about sixty x no. revenue multiples, um, which is yeah. a lot more expensive. Right. Yeah. Oh yeah, yeah. That, that's that's amazing. Mon, um, what's your you... sense of this trend? Are the are the Series D valuations and round sizes going to keep going down or is it bounced or what's the, what's going to happen next? You know, if, if you look at the uh, historical, like if you look at this track record over the past 10 years, what I think what you'll find is that for the most part, there's a, there's a range that these stuff, like we talk about the SAS multiples Dave was referring to, for the most part, seven, eight, nine times sales multiples was the norm. There were outliers on the high side, outliers on the low side. There was a, there was a brief period. Let's you say know, 10x, Amon. We're, we're all bright, shiny, above average students. Let's say 10x. Make the math easy. Yeah, there you go. That's a round number. Like there was a brief <laughs> period in 2014, 15 when we crashed below that. And then 2019, 20, 21, 2021, we're above that. But um, we're, we're now getting back to this historical norm. We're maybe on the low side of the, um, of the normal. So mm -hmm. it actually might be a good time to, to invest. Um, I don't think I think things the last couple of quarters have gotten better, not worse. So it feels like the worst is behind us, and we're we're slowly getting better. But it feels to me like a normalization to where we were, you know, let's say prior to 2020. So when we when we talk to founders and a lot of founders ask about like, hey, what are the metrics I should be solving for? What's normal? I, I get 50 times sales isn't you know doable anymore. But what's a reasonable what's a reasonable multiple to 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 think about? Here's, here's how I'd frame the advice to founders. Like here, here's like five or six metrics for SaaS companies, and this will work too for some other deep tech or e-commerce companies that investors are paying attention to. The, if your metrics are on the left side of the chart, meaning you're, you're hitting it and you're awesome, you'll have a successful fundraising conversation. We can talk about the multiples and what the price gets done at, but you better have an awesome set of metrics on, on these scores. So one, as Dave said before, you gotta be look at the sales and your growth. If you're, not, if you're not growing your sales, your multiple, you know, multiple on sales is going to get severely reduced. So right now, are you growing at two times, three times? Um, the best companies we've seen in this environment are growing three times year over year. If you're growing at two times year over year, like a Series A company, that's, uh, that's very good. If you're like below two times, that's probably a non-starter, meaning you probably won't even get financed at any, at any price in this environment. Um, that is probably wow. the most important metric, but gross margins matter. Are gross margins 70% or 50% higher or lower? Like that really matters. So you better, you better understand and be able to present and manage what your cost of sales are. Um, if you're a SaaS company, net revenue retention is something that is very important. If you don't know I'm what that for is. The, for the noobs, how about you go start yes. from the beginning for growth in AR and go through gross margins and the rest of them, please. Thank you so much. But, 
By the way, did yeah, you I'll, credit I'll uh, our colleague uh, David Sachs because we're stealing all his mojo here? Oh, yeah. yeah. <laughs> well, some of these metrics are, there's a lot of SaaS metrics in here that you should, um, if you're a SaaS founder or whatever you're doing, right, you should be aware of what these metrics mean. So growth in ARR is uh, annual recurring revenue. So you've got contracts that you're signed up with people that counts as recurring revenue. If you're, um, it doesn't mean you recognize it all in the same year. You may have to deliver. There may be, you know, accounting considerations for how you recognize it. But accounting, uh, ARR is basically your annual recurring revenue based on the contracts you have. Gross margins are take that and just net out your cost of sales, which is really ad server costs and a few other tech costs related to delivering on that, on that service revenue. Mm -hmm. Net revenue retention is super important. Like of my existing customers, how many of them come back? Do they come back with more money? Do they come back with less money? Do I churn them? Um, what's the value of that group over time? Um, LTV to CAC is just the lifetime value of a customer divided by the cost of acquisition. So when I get a customer, what do I think that person's worth over time? I got to net out some costs. I got to figure out how long that customer relationship is. I have to uh, make some assumptions on the value of the customer over a lifetime period. And then what did it cost for me to acquire them? Did I get them through a, a Google ad? Did I get them through a referral? Did I get them through a, a salesperson? But you have to be able to account for and manage all those costs. And then the last thing is just profitability. And if you don't get to profitability, that's okay. But um, David Sachs came up with this thing called a burn multiple, which is what is my, what is my burn divided by my net new ARR? Um, so all these things are things that are available. To, to, you can research them on the internet. You can find what they, what they mean, how you define them. They're all you know, pretty much standardized now in the SaaS investor world. So you should know what these metrics are. And if you're basically lining up on the awesome side, then that means that you're going to have a successful fundraising conversation. People will invest. Um, you'll just be it's a conversation about what the valuation is. If your numbers are on the right hand side, like you're growing at less than two x, or your margins are below fifty percent at the gross level, or you're churning a lot of customers, or your LTV to CAC is you know is below one, like those are all red flags. And I'd, I'd counsel you to fix those things before you get into those fundraising conversations, because if you don't fix them now, the investors will look at it, and you're going to have a problem you know, identifying what the, how do you, how do you solve the problem and getting the fundraising done? So better to fix your house and get to some, you know, some modicum of profitability or net burn, fix your unit economics, make sure you're able to grow and demonstrate growth as a precursor to the conversations. And in 2020, that wasn't the case. A lot of companies were raising when they had challenging metrics across the board. Um, in this environment, you, you, you can't, you can't afford that. So it's a good, I think, discipline and framework for a lot of founders to talk to investors. I'm on well said. I'm going to clip this. This is like a quick founder's crash course in finance. Thank you. 1010, 10, well said. Should we go to the next slide? Yeah. So I think a lot of the, um, a lot of the conversations we're having um, right now with, with investors and founders is on interest rates, right? A lot of people think that interest rates are very, very high, certainly higher than they've been in the last three years. Surely now the Fed is starting to cut rates. Uh, it certainly seems like that is going to help the evaluation environment. Maybe that's a good thing for the stock market, for the IPO market. Um, is, it, is it a good thing for founders? Let's just talk a bit about rate cuts. And what, I'm, what, I'm, what I want to discuss is will rate cuts really help the evaluation environment? Um, let's just start off with some basics on when I say interest rates, what does that mean? There is no one interest rate for the whole economy. There's actually a whole bunch of interest rates for the economy. There is short-term rates, especially in government securities where the Federal Reserve has a huge influence. They change their rate every time they go to a meeting. They change the effective federal funds rate, and that really affects where banks can lend to each other. So that has a huge impact on short-term rates, like inside of one month. But there are other interest rates. There's like long-term rates. There's your credit card interest rate. There are home mortgage rates for startup founders. Like, where can I, where can I actually borrow? If, I'm, if I had to go to a venture debt fund, what would that interest rate be? Um, all of those interest rates have very little to do with the short-term federal funds rate. If you don't believe me, just look at this chart. I've just taken three, the last three years, January of 2024, January 2023, January 2022, and I've just charted interest rates with a, a time axis on the bottom and then where rates are on the y-axis. So as of where we are right now, it's that blue curve where the, the short-term rates are a little over five and a quarter percent. Long-term rates are somewhere around four percent. It's what we call an inverted yield curve meaning those short-term rates are higher than the long-term rates, right? That's a little bit unusual. Um, go back a year, the curve was inverted. Generally, rates are a little bit lower than they are now, but the curve was uh, a little bit inverted. Not quite as inverted as we are today, but it's, you can see a similar pattern to where we are today. 
go back to Jan 2022, look at how low, look at where the rates were. You had the low, low rates under like half a percent, long rates much higher. That's more of a normal yield curve. So typically what you see is a curve like that. Short rates are, are relatively low, long rates are relatively long or relatively high, and you get this upward slope to the yield curve. It's quite possible that the Fed will start cutting rates in the next six months. In fact, that's kind of what the market is, is betting on. But just because those short-term rates come down doesn't mean that the whole yield curve comes down across the board. In fact, if the curve mm-hmm. normalizes, what could happen is you got short-term rates coming down, long rates kind of stay where they are. And so the five-year, the 10-year, the home mortgage rates, um, if you go to a bank and get a, like a five-year loan if, for your startup, all those rates aren't going to change all that much, even if the Fed starts to cut pretty, pretty dramatically. So it's quite possible that rates don't change all that much, especially where it really matters for startup founders. In the next six months, you'll hear a lot about um, the Fed and the Fed meeting and Fed moves and the Fed rate cuts. And maybe that'll help the IPO market at the margin. But I don't know that things get a whole lot better because the rates, the market's already pricing a lot of that in and the yield curve is already kind of inverted. And so it's quite possible the rates you're really more focused on don't look all that different a year from now than, than where you're at now. Gotcha. And if the Fed fund rates go down and the the maybe the long term rates stay where they are, is it yeah. because the banks the banks are thinking like, well, yes, the Fed's lowering rates, but there still is an inflation risk, so we're not going to just give away. We're not just going to lower the rates on our, on our loans because we're worried about potential inflation risk. Um, that can be completely yeah, wrong. I think just go for it. inflation risk. Some of that is just a normal yield curve looks more like that gray that gray line at the bottom. Typically, yeah. what you'll see for inflation um, term risk. Default risk, usually a bank will say, hey, my 10-year rate is going to be much higher than my one-year rate. Uh, you think about how, how home mortgages work like five years ago, locking in longer rates was just you're going to pay a higher, you're going to pay a premium, a term premium, they call it. Um, that's kind of gone away in the last couple of years, and that's, that's very unusual. So in a n- more normal environment, you'd expect that if, if short-term rates are down to 3.5%, like where do you think the Fed's going to cut rates to? They're at 55 today. Can they cut to 35 I mean, maybe. That, those are some big moves. But the long end could still stay north of three and a half, maybe in the fours, maybe even up to five percent. So it's it's more a function of a normalization of the yield curve in a term premium than than anything else. I do kind of think the worst of inflation is behind us. I think that's going to be a positive story. So I think the Fed has room to begin to cut at the low end. I just don't know what's going to happen at the long end, and I don't know that all flows through into the startup ecosystem quite the way that people think. Excellent. Well, well you said. call that that uh, gray line normal. Yeah. I- I think you're you're saying that the shape of it is normal, Correct. but isn't it really low, sort of historically? Very good. Yeah, that's exactly right. The shape is normal, just meaning that the difference between the let's say the one month and the ten year, it should be like two hundred, you know, two hundred ish basis points. But you're right; these are historically super low rates. We haven't seen anything like this. If you go back four hundred years in American history, there's like one or two periods where you see rates this low for three hundred and eighty of those four hundred years. We were sitting at five, six, seven percent rates of interest, kind of, kind of where we are now or higher. Um, this is this is a very unusual, very low rate environment, a very benign environment, and so I think that's that's Unless, a of course for anyone more than Japan. twenty years old. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> Unless you're enjoying Japanese interest rates, but but yeah. for both of you guys, it seems like if rates go back By the way, to anywhere nobody close enjoys to that Japanese line, interest rates, including the Japanese. <laughs> if it goes back to that January 2022 line, wouldn't that really juice yeah. the economy? Yeah, we're not um, going back to that. I don't think so. It's not happening. No. <laughs> I think Dave's right. We're not. Um, you know, the most – If let me, let me ask you this question uh, as a way of answering. The, the two best growth periods in the United States since World War II were the 1960s, number one, and the 1980s, number two. Do you know what interest rates were in the 1960s, the 1980s? In the 80s, it reached as high as like 15%, right? Yeah, at the worst of it. The, um, the, for the most part, there were 7 to 10%. Mm. In the 1960s, we had a gold standard. So there was no printing money. There was no money supply. The government, we actually, have, we actually ran um, fiscal surpluses under John F. Kennedy, um, believe it or not. And so it was a tight money. Inflation was, un, was contained, but the economic growth approach was very strong. But rates were six, seven, eight, nine, ten percent for much of the nineteen sixties and the nineteen eighties. The worst growth period we've had in U.S. history, going back to World War II again, um, has really been like after two thousand nine. The last twelve, fifteen years, productivity growth has been far lower than the eighties, far lower than the nineteen sixties, and yet it's been the easiest money period. So 
and, and Japan's a perfect example. They've brought it up. What's what's been Japanese GDP per capita? You know, in this they've had thirty years of super low interest rates, zero percent interest rates. You know what GDP per capita is in Japan uh, over that thirty year period? It's about yeah, zero. It's increased much. Yeah. Oh, growth. You're talking about. Yeah. yeah. Sorry. The growth. Growth. Zero. Exactly forty thousand. Um, wow, Dave, you've really done your homework on macroeconomics. Oh, yeah. That was that a plus. You got it. <laughs> That's That's for Japan. Dave's yeah. now a regular on the show. Thank you, Dave. Dave's now a regular. You should... <laughs> Sorry, I missed that. But it that. hasn't I, grown at all. My screen was, was frozen was a little bit. Oh, we were saying was... that you have a savant. You're just like picking up GDP numbers. <laughs> out. Like, oh, uh, Turkestan, that's uh, 20,000. It's like, wow. <laughs> it's actually amazing. <laughs> yeah, that Dave has yeah, we're, we're I, I don't know globally, yeah. but my wife's Japanese, so that's why I know that one. But I, I probably do have a reasonable oh, handle uh, on GDP by not, country. For... Now we're not impressed. We're not uh, impressed you know, anymore now. For OECD countries, I'm probably... I bet you I could be within 20% for most OECD countries and probably even a few that are off that list. Oh. So that's one of my skills okay, now is I have an okay, ab ab abnormal obsession with uh, population GDP and uh, other numbers globally. But, but that's still a lot to keep track of. That's amazing. I love that. What, you're that's just awesome. like amazed by He's me right. bragging about something? You have no idea whether I'm right or not. I'm just talking shit out of my ass. So <laughs> unless, somebody, unless you grill me on those numbers and like know what they are. It was profound bullshit. You sold it to me well. You sold the right, head. Yes, so, exactly. Bravo. There we go. I, I was, was going to say, Amon, um, you're making a really good point of like interest rates are not in like a vacuum. There's other things going on. And when I was thinking about the 60s and 80s. I was thinking about the Reagan tax cuts and the uh, LBJ tax cuts that gave the yep. economy like kind of shots, shot in the arm. But then we continued doing tax cuts after that. And it's like we haven't gotten the same juice. Um, yeah, so, kind of, good. Kind of, sort of. There were there were definitely the things that we were were in common in between sixties and eighties were there were there were cuts in tax rates under under John F. Kennedy actually and then LBJ signed the bill after Kennedy was uh, unfortunately killed. Um, those uh, tax look, rates look came at down from ninety one to credit to progressive tax policy by Democrats. Holy crap! Who would who would have thought? Absolutely, was this unusual? I call it, I call it as I oh, see yeah. it, man. Those uh, <laughs> tax is, rates Amon came down right from. That's right. Ah. So under Eisenhower, tax rates were up to 91% after World War II, and Eisenhower held them there. Kennedy cut them to 70. LBJ signed the bill. They then got cut down to 50% under Reagan. And so the tax rates came down, but both what, those, what Kennedy and Reagan both did was they simplified the tax code, eliminated a lot of the tax deductions and a lot of the uh, quirks in the tax code that were essentially like tax subsidies. Um, we've done some mm -hmm. tax cuts since, but it's been more in the spirit of like, tax subsidies, you know, like um, energy incentives, a child tax credit. It doesn't really affect the tax rate. A bunch of corporate tax cuts so, a few years ago. Yeah, we did those that in was 2017. Actually one of the more positive yeah. things that I think, one of the only positive things, in my opinion, that came out of the Trump administration, <laughs> but sort of normalizing <laughs> dangerous uh, tax uh, rates in the rest of the world. No, no politics here. We're very dangerous. And oh, we, we have all kinds of politics, politics in our partnership. Are, we're, our sixth position on politics, we're left of socialist and right of libertarian, so everyone's clear about where we stand on <laughs> I, things. I think Amon um, and I are wow. in lockstep on capitalism. Uh, where we get off uh, maybe a little bit is different uh, social progressive policies and uh, yeah, in mm. our previous presidents. Uh, for the say, record, uh, Dave won more subsidies. Stretching. Dave won more subsidies. Dave won more subsidies for scooter companies like Lime. He thinks it's very good for the economy. Uh, <laughs> you talking me free, or not? Free free yeah, you. you know. <laughs> uh, no, no, no. I I was never big on scooter companies. I thought that was a little crazy, but it turns out. That was it was actually crazy, but still. You're right. <laughs> the, the scooters themselves make sense. The valuations, maybe not. Um, but, no. but we are generally in agreement on yeah. capitalism and pro business. Just you know, social policies maybe have a little bit of different opinion. Yeah. Exactly. Mind you, have three. You have like roughly three rate cuts happening in this coming year. On average, I'm gonna guess. I'm just telling you. Yeah, I'm just telling you what I think the market is. Uh, is is kind of baked in. So the odds of a rate cut, and what, what I just do is I look at the Fed futures and I look at how these things trade on the bond market. And so you can sort of tell what the market is pricing in. It seems like they're saying, hey, for January, this, there's a meeting coming up in 12 days. We're not going to see a rate cut in January. In March, it's like 50-50. By May or June, we'll certainly see one rate cut, maybe you know, maybe two or three. I, I don't know. I, I'll, just, I'll just tell you this. The Fed has basically a dual mandate. They have two jobs that's officially in their charter. And I think Jerome Powell gets this now. Um, one of those jobs is price stability. 
one of those jobs is like full employment. Nowhere in the Fed's mandate does it say, help the stock market get better, help you know the venture capital community be happy. Um, obviously, there's political <laughs> that's, the, that's the, the, the Illuminati's just, job. Yeah. That's all underneath the surface. We can't talk about that. We'd have to kill you. <laughs> the, the lizard is, people. You're right. That is the we, we have made job. those deals. We absolutely have made those deals. We just can't talk about them. Yeah, we ah, can't talk about them. That's no. right. We can't talk about VC. them. Right. But if, I'm if, we talk, you, if we talk about them, your days are numbered. Sorry. So we don't want to have to kill everybody who listens to this podcast. I know. I see red dot in my head right now. So please yeah, stop. Exactly. <laughs> It'll affect your viewership. Well, the official job of the Fed is like you got to get inflation down to price stability is the official, the official mandate. They have to find that as being 2% rate of inflation. For better or for worse, now I, you know, I grew up in the 1980s. We had 3 or 4% inflation. I don't remember being in an inflationary hellhole. But anyway, when the Fed says 2% and they don't get to 2%, I feel like that's a credibility problem. And I don't know that the Fed's going to change the 2%, 2 target. We're at about 4% today. So we're a long way from 2%. So I think the Fed only cuts if inflation comes under control and continues to get better. I don't know that that's a given. So I think the market's maybe getting a little bit ahead of itself and pricing in you know, 80 90% probability of these kinds of rate cuts. I would say yeah. plus one. Plus one, you said because I remember last year everyone was like, plus. "Yes, there's gonna be there's gonna be cuts in October. It's gonna happen, everyone." And it was just everyone who invested in a lot That's of right. shitty, overvalued tech companies or a lot of shitty real estate were like, "I got to refinance. I hope they cut her. I'm screwed." And it's like, you know, right now the economy and not making any political positions is pretty darn good for unemployment. But if you ask about yes. any other, myself, when I go to the store. It's like, yes. wait a minute. Now, anytime I leave Safeway, I'm coming out with a hundred dollar yeah. bill, hundred dollar plus bill. Oh Man, my that god, sucks. and yeah, that hurts like every day. Right. So yeah, I think that's right, and I think I think Powell gets that now, and 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 I think there's also a political motive in an election year. Like you know, voters understand inflation, right? So I think voters can be like, you got to get inflation. Everyone thinks prices are too high. I think there's a lot of political pressure on the Fed just to keep the the uh, to keep tight money until Fed and inflation is really licked, and it's it's not there yet. So you know, what about the other is, half of this okay. mandate, Amon? Well, the other half of the mandate is the full employment mandate, and we are at a three point nine percent unemployment rate as of like Friday. Um, now we were at three four at, at a prior period, so the unemployment's ticked up a little bit, but three point nine percent is still historically full employment. So mm -hmm. I think if the Fed is doing its job, there's no reason to think they're going to cut until they really see inflation drop to two percent. Um, which is why I think maybe the market's getting a little bit ambitious in pricing in. Mm -hmm. You know some of those rate cuts. Yep. Um, this is one other one other chart that we created. We um, we look at the difference between bond yields and stock yields, and something this is something we talked about in our last podcast. But it shows basically if I if I own a basket of stocks, I get earnings and I get dividends from those mm -hmm. stocks, right? That's my earnings yield from stocks. Um, I could just go buy bonds, right, in the bond market from the exact same companies, and I'll get interest on the bonds. So which is a better what's a better deal? Historically, if I look at the last twenty years. It's a better deal to own stocks, meaning the earnings and the, the, the dividends I get from stocks, that yield is ahead of where bonds are by maybe 100 basis points, 200 basis points. It's certainly more than, it's certainly ahead of zero. In the last year and a half, that's actually flipped for the first time in probably 20 years, meaning that if I'm just owning stocks, the yield that I'm getting on those stocks compared to what I'm getting on bonds is no longer favorable. I'm getting more out of bonds than stocks, so why wouldn't I want to own bonds? Well, you know, maybe you own stocks for other reasons, but the stock market, if it doesn't give, doesn't give me the same kind of yield that I'm getting on bonds, it's just kind of expensive. It's historically not a great time to own stocks. And boy, oh boy, over the past two years, I'd say the stock market's gotten really expensive relative to, to bond yields. And it's sort of plunged into this, this red zone where if I'm a stock market investor, I'm feeling a little bit nervous about owning stocks versus owning bonds, probably for the first time in the last, certainly the last 15 years, maybe even the last 25 years. Amon, is that number worse or better for the non-Magnificent Seven companies? It is better for the non-Magnificent Seven companies. So if I redid this for the, the S&P 493, not, yeah. the, not, the, not these big large cap tech stocks, the, the, earnings, the price earnings ratio is about 15x right now, which actually is pretty good. And, mm -hmm. and that feels like that's a better deal than bonds. So... This, so there is some, just, there's this, a lot of distortion here. Yeah, it feels like most of this is coming from over speculation on the top tech seven companies. Um, some of which might be justified, yes. but some of which seems yes. There's the, so there's seven misplaced. big cap tech stocks, basically what you call the fang the fang stocks, but throw them in 
NVIDIA and take out Netflix and throw in Tesla. And they have a much richer price earnings ratio of like 50 times right now. And they're sort of inflating the whole S&P 500 story. And they're, they're, they're kind of making this look a little bit worse. So if I'm if I'm an index stock investor, I'm seeing, wow, stocks seem expensive. But Dave's exactly right. Um, a lot of that expensive feeling is like the top seven are really, really expensive and are a bigger share of the market than ever. And the other 493 actually, you know, seem to trade at a more reasonable historical valuation. Right. So if you're expecting like reversion of the mean, you could move into bonds or you could just rebalance yeah, right. your portfolio you out of short the the uh, fang. That would be a brave short, stance or you to could take short right the now. fangs. You could do a spread. Yeah, yeah. You could yeah. do a spread. Actually, what I would do is I would yeah. go long Facebook or long Meta and short the rest. I, I think that's actually not a bad Ooh. bet right now. Interesting. Interesting. Yeah. If you uh, believe in AI, I want to hear more about that think, real quick. Yeah. Oh, because of the recent the, uh, the recent yep. open sourcing of models and the all in on the AI features. Yeah, I, I was going to say I'm betting I on AI. Sorry, don't David, bet against that. Off. Yeah, I was going to give yep. credit to Amon because Amon, when the last Facebook drama of a year or two ago, when they were getting rid of people, the stock was going down, and Amon was like, yes. "Give me access to your blog. I want to break one thing." He was like. By Facebook. And I, well, I don't, I, he wasn't betting he on the, the AI play. He was just betting on them stopping the investments no, in Metaverse. No, I want to hear yes. your, now, Dave, <laughs> Dave, hear yes. your thesis. I, I want to hear your thesis because I had this whole idea, too, of like right now Elon's running for the Everything app, and I'm looking at WhatsApp, Instagram, Facebook, and if they can get AI properly plugged in there, it seems like Zuckerberg is really a, a great advantage of this. So, Dave, I stole your thunder. Go in there. Tell us what you think and why you're yeah. bullish on Facebook and AI. Well, far be it for me to like give advice for public stocks because I don't really pay play in public stocks anyway. Um, and I, I usually would say don't bet oh, against on. Elon. Uh, but well, the only thing mm -hmm. I've held the long term for public stocks is Twilio, and actually I did fa fairly terribly on that. Like I made a ton of money on Twilio in the private market, so I, lo I think I lost money in the public markets personally when I held on to it forever. Uh, but anyway. Um, I, I think, you know, if you want to give uh, credit for AI having a public, having a positive impact on companies, usually I think that's overplayed, but I think in the case of Facebook, it's probably not overplayed. Um, they have a ton of reach. Mm -hmm. uh, they probably can get quite a bit of distribution for whatever they do. And I really would say don't bet against Zuck. Like, more than anybody, he's the person mm. I would say don't bet against. <laughs> uh, and, you know, he sort of fucked up the whole metaverse thing. I think that was, you know, a bit of a boondoggle, but I think it only took him two years to correct on that. Um, so I think they're back into a reasonable well, spend in most areas. Premature. Uh, I mean, right. I'm sure Joe, in the long term, in the long term, sure, there'll be, you know, some kind of metaverse and some kind of hardware software solution that is addressing that. But I think everybody was jumping onto a market that wasn't there yet um, by, by any means. Yep. Uh, and so yeah, I, think I saw some super uh, people... early on metaverse and all that yeah. sort of stuff. Uh, Again, we were early. Again. Again. No, I, I, I agree with you. I saw founders of Google who, who took their winnings from me acquired by Google and they started their own VC specializing on VR. And I'm like, oh boy, not good. Not a good idea. <laughs> not now. Yeah. Um, Anyway, so, but uh, I think that, uh, you know, probably the, the reason I was kind of picking up on the, that chart, though, is that I think if you took out the top seven companies, which I think people have given a lot of uh, faith in their yeah. ability to use AI to improve, you know, revenues and margins and et cetera, probably I feel like that's overplayed with the exception of NVIDIA, uh, who mm. really is making a shit ton of money <laughs> on other people buying their chips yeah. for AI. Um, and, you know, you can mm -hmm. argue whether... Mm -hmm. Google, Microsoft, Apple, Amazon are going to use AI to their benefit. I'm sure that they are, but it just feels like the stock market's probably over emphasizing that maybe mm. more than is the reality. Um, so I think it's really like mm. a tale of two uh, stock groups, I guess. There's no uh, metaphor to be made on tale of two <laughs> cities, but you know, yeah. there's, there's yep. I guess in the private markets, there's AI companies yeah. and other companies. And in the public markets, there's the big tech seven and other companies. And I think it's important yep. to look at those groups of companies slightly differently. And then even within the tech seven, I think you, was, you should argue about which ones fairly deserve, you know, an AI multiple on, on their growth and profits yeah. and which ones maybe don't. Um, mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. We'll 
Well said, Amon. You want to pick up this one? The debt supply. A lot of questions here, so this is a great slide. Yeah, this is, um, I guess, one more reason to be a little concerned about interest rates, or at least how fast interest rates will come down. One of the factors that goes into interest rates is like the supply demand dynamic on bonds. We've talked about this in the prior uh, podcast, but just as a reminder, the um, the supply and demand of bonds affects interest rates because if you get too much supply of bonds, then that pushes the 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 prices of bonds down and the yields go up. And um, if you have a favorable, like if everybody wants your debt and everyone's buying bonds and they drive the prices up, then yields go down. So mm -hmm. in that long end of the curve, this turns into a, a really important driver of where like where long yields go. And if, if even if the Fed starts cutting rates on the short end, the question really is what happens in like five, 10, 20 year debt? And the observation I'll, I'll make is just the supply demand dynamic of debt right now in the US is about as bad as I've seen it in 20 years. And I used to, I used to trade this stuff in Wall Street in the mid 1990s, late 1990s. That was my first job out of, out of undergrad. So if I look at how supply demand, you know, this when I began trading bonds, it was the it actually was the Clinton administration, and we had balanced budgets in ninety eight, ninety nine, two thousand, two thousand one. So we weren't issuing a ton of treasuries every Mom, year. Mon, you're giving more credit to liberal politicians. What are yeah. what are balanced budgets in the government? I don't know what you're talking about. Can you explain ask, what that is? What does that mean? You have to ask your father what a what a balanced budget is because we haven't we haven't had one in a while. But um, but it's basically when you know when the treasury's like we don't need to issue any bonds, and I, I'd be like. What do you mean you don't need to issue any bonds? Because we got taxes coming in that's paying for all the bills. Balanced um, budgets have its happened since what do I do Clinton, every baby. Yeah, exactly. How am I going to trade? Uh, you know, what do I trade then? Well, I had you know I had to trade secondary. I had to buy bonds from other investors who wanted to sell. It was a whole all it was was secondary markets. Um, if you go back five years, we were you know we were issuing debts to cover deficits. This is 2016, 17. We were issuing like 500 million, uh, sorry, 500 billion annually to cover our debts, 600 billion, 500 billion. Those were, back at the time, we thought those were big deficits. We have been issuing trillions of dollars of debt in the last three years. This year, which is um, you know economic growth year, low employment, so on and so forth. The issue, the treasuries can issue, or in 2023, issue 2 trillion of debt. So we've like quadrupled our debt issuance over the past four years. So a lot more bond supply coming on the market now than, than really ever before. And then at least a couple of major buyers have left the market. The biggest buyer of treasuries, um, certainly over the last 10 years and, and probably in U.S. history is with the Federal Reserve. They're no longer buying bonds. They've, they've gone away from what they call quantitative easing to quantitative tightening. So they're actually a seller of bonds, not a, not a buyer of bonds. I don't think the Chinese are buying any more bonds this year. They've become a net seller of U.S. treasuries, U.S. securities, U.S. dollar denominated assets. And so and other governments are you know talking about that as well from – Eastern Europe to um, Saudi Arabia. So there's a lot of money that's leaving the ecosystem that used to be buying, and yet a lot more selling going on. So that also sort of tells me that, boy, over the next year or two, if we don't get our fiscal house in order, it seems like that's upward pressure, downward pressure on bonds, upward pressure on long interest rates. That's not good for you know the macro environment or valuations or stock market valuations either. Do we have a lot Although of I, debt I would we still have to say refine? Isn't yeah, we have a fuck ton of debt we need to refinance. Um, but I think uh, yeah. the other issue I would raise, yeah. Amon, is aren't we still a better story than most governments, most places on the earth? Don't people still think of the U.S. as, you know, even with high interest rates and a huge budget deficit, aren't we still a better place to park assets than most parts of the world? I guess that's arguably so, you know, like 4 or 5% Where, where yields, else are you going to put it? Uh, other than Bitcoin, right? Euro. <laughs> Doge. Yeah. What about what happened to ETH? I thought, Dave, you're a Bitcoin maximalist. Uh, I, you, can, you can see I, money. Go well, yeah. I mean, I, I tend to be a long-term believer in digital currencies. I'm probably more believer in stablecoin than any particular, yeah. you know, cryptocurrency. And I'm probably a little mm -hmm. bit more bullish on Ethereum than Bitcoin. Yeah. But I'm not the expert on cryptocurrencies. I just know that. In the short term, yeah. cryptocurrency is, is volatile as hell and a little bit insane and a bit of a you mm -hmm. know, momentum yeah. sort of stuck, if you will. But long term, mm -hmm. crypto is a much better place to park your money than any uh, country's currency, uh, in my opinion. Mm. Yes. Yes. I was teasing. I, 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 I hate that I'm saying this. I US. fucking hate that I'm saying this because I sound like sound like a crypto. <laughs> I know. Guy, and that's, I know. that's like that's not fun, my Dave. This time it's different. Not at all my story. We were going to – actually, you're stealing this your This time it's so, different, Dave. Dave. We're going to keep Dave our currency an, solvent. 
Dave has an in- initial uh, initial coin offering happening at the end of this episode, so we'll go into that more uh, after. So, well, I should have <laughs> leaned into crypto ten years ago when I was like hanging out with Brock Pierce and Adam Draper and all those folks. And unfortunately, I did not do that. Uh, but you know, I felt like it was a momentum bet for forever. I still feel like it's a momentum momentum bet, but certainly, you know, yeah, it's better than a central economy. <laughs> of any kind, even the US. Yeah, and if you if you think it's volatile short term and and a good bet long term, yeah, I, th- I think we, I think Dave, you just might have answered your own question. Like, is this really where else do you go if not the US dollar? You know, we've we've seen currencies give up the global reserve status in the past. It's happened like the, it happened to the UK in the 1930s and the 40s in World War II, and almost every long single long one of them. Where do I go if I'm not the UK? Where do I go? Where do I go? I know the UK is at war. They've got inflation. There's a European conflict. Where do I go? All of a sudden, the Americans came along, and within five years, the UK pound began to devalue. And the same thing happened to the Dutch gilder before that, you know, if you look at history. So I think right now, you know, short term, I don't know where people go besides the US dollar. But five years from now, people like Dave are saying, you know what? Cryptocurrencies, maybe there's a, maybe there's like a um, European Union a combination of Saudi Arabia, BRICS countries creating alternatives. Maybe they're, in the, maybe they're blockchain. Maybe it's just a commodity basket of currencies. You know, this stuff, we don't have a long term monopoly on being the global reserve currency that's for sure and if we don't if we have this kind of debt going on um if countries are worried about their u.s dollar assets being frozen or being taken away or sanctioned like those are all little things that all of a sudden within a very short term um we could lose that status and then and then you'll definitely see rates go up from four percent to you know six seven eight percent like that it doesn't take that much to push the rates that high yeah well said i think we have the world war ii dividend of you know winning the war and then getting able to set up uh britain was it britain woods in britain europe woods, yeah yeah, yeah, and then being able to be the reserve currency, which allowed us to run so many large debts. But then we think, hey, you know, we're America; yeah. it's always going to be this way. But not, not, not a given. So, um, it's 1971. Until then, we're in the gold standard. So the only reason yeah. why Bretton Woods worked was because it was a uh, yes, a U.S. dollar standard, but it was a gold standard. And then we, and then we left the gold standard. And you know, for most of our history, um, we've been on gold standards or fixed, mm-hmm. fixed uh, commodity standards. That that is not true today, but that's the exception, not the norm. And well, so we could go back to I some kind we're... of commodity standard. I think at this point we're on the capitalism standard, not the gold standard. But you know, if we're running budget deficits, <laughs> we're not really being very good stewards of capital. Um, did you guys catch the uh, Millet speech at Davos, I, or the translated version of that, the AI translated no, version uh, of that? No, uh, I give absolutely us an update, please. recommend taking a listen. I thought he was a little bit wacky, but I just listened to that talk a couple hour, hours That's ago. That's his trademark. It's though. pretty fucking good. Like I, Andreessen yeah. and a bunch of other people were pimping it out all over the place. And I'm like, oh, okay, of course they're pimping it out. I mean, I'm a big fan of Mark, but, you know, sometimes I think he gets a little bit over the top on, you know, uh, American dynamism and all that <laughs> shit. Um, but, you know, general, generally yeah. I agree with him on most of that, though. I think that's in the right place. But I was really impressed with that speech, at least most parts of it. And really interesting. Like, I think I would boil, boil down to his comments as, like, in general, you want the markets to be running shit, not centralized economies. Most people understand that statement. And, you know, the extreme versions of that are communism and mm-hmm. socialism versus capitalism. A much more subtle version of that mm-hmm. is any central state controlled actor is basically introducing elements of socialism or at least a centrally planned economy. And so interest rates, by definition, set by the Fed are a planned economy thing and and yeah. regulatory environments even though we generally agree hey regulatory environments are probably good for enforcing rules but like it's also a centralized guess at what the rules should be not a market set dynamic for what the rules should be and so his his way hmm. out there sort of simplified concept was if you are having any central state actor in in getting themselves involved in an economy you're essentially introducing elements of socialism, or at least you're fucking up the possibly, you know, unadulterated model of the market. And I was like, wow, that's a crazy way to think about it. And and I still feel like, okay, you have to right, enforce think... market rules and standards. Um, but, but it was interesting right. to think about right. people trying to tweak things in any manner is basically central planning. Exactly. And I remember in, I, well, 
my my econ 101 class my professor was just like and there's a concept called crowding out when the federal government comes in they just ask for more and more debt good yes. things that need debt like small businesses or medium-sized businesses can't afford it anymore so then those things are unproductive well the people who are well connected I, in the economy might generally be able to agree with politicians run rampant are always going to spend yeah. more money so like you know they'll they'll yeah. introduce mm -hmm. budget initiatives they'll overrun budgets they'll cut taxes just for election effects, not necessarily for free market principles. And so I'm, I'm always a little bit concerned about, you know, central, central economies yeah. planned by politicians and economists feels dangerous. <laughs> but yeah, then if you have a completely you, unregulated it, economy, you're going to have bad actors, you know, subvert the system too. So you're saying there's, there's, there's mixed capitalism, something in, a, something in the middle. Yeah, I what, what concerned me was in Mexico um, during their elections in the seventies and eighties. Anytime the power party was in power, they would just lower interest rates and then make the sign that the economy is good, create inflation, destroy the value of the currency, create debt crisis, which is terrible. Um, we have a good video with Amon talking about debt, which is really good. I'll link you all here. Um, we first of all, fantastic presentation, Amon, David. We need you back, Dave. We need you back here again. Um, we had a question from our audience. <laughs> um, so our audience says uh, a good FTA to you too. Okay, so. Insider story. Uh, when Ilya Sussberg kind of went on the res reservation, uh, he was doing interviews with AI people and say, uh, before I start this interview, do you really feel the AGI? And some <laughs> of the engineers would be like, uh, are you on like meth or something? Because this is not a good interview. So then we started our own insider thing of feel the AGI. Feel the AGI. And so now everyone in, in the chat, everyone, everyone in the chat, exactly. Everyone in the chat is now like FTA. So they said, this guy said like FTA to you guys. Um, Amon oh, and Dave, okay, welcome awesome. to the show. What, what, what are your thoughts on joining AI companies that started before chat GPT and now their models are kind of out of date and they're overvalued um, so would a, would a down round was, was probably possible. Like, what would you do as an employee to like protect yourself? Would it be just not even go to those companies or like, what was, wow. what's the, what's the thought there? I, I don't feel informed enough to offer advice in this area. Um, mm -hmm. I guess. So, so what's the general question is like, I'm, I'm working for an general AI 1.0 yeah. company. Is that a good, should I leave or yep. stay? Mm. Yeah. Or should uh, I go there? What's an example there, yeah. of an AI 1.0 company? Who I don't want to put AI anyone under the bus, but basically. Oh, okay, sorry, right, right, yeah. Uh, yeah, yeah. So just think about all the models that were being trained and they seem pretty good. And then ChatGPT came out and I was like, oh my God, that thing is like crash to the point now that these yeah. companies are piping in ChatGPT and laying off their AI researchers, but they yeah, still yeah. have this huge valuation. And it's just like, now you're just a middle person is for that, chat is that better or worse than actual AI 2.0 companies' stratospheric valuations? <laughs> mm -hmm. That's uh, an even better question. Yeah, so. I'm That's not really question. sure about that one. Well, here's the, the default response to this. This is an interesting, just like, when should you leave any job in tech? Do you know the math on vesting mm -hmm. options? So assuming you have four-year vesting schedule. Mm -hmm. So here, here's the mm -hmm. way I think about mm -hmm. it, which is from year zero to year one is infinitely better, assuming the company is going to be worth anything, because as soon as you cliff after the end of the first year, you have some options, whereas before you had zero options. From year one to year two, you're going to double the amount of options that you have from you know one year worth of vesting to mm -hmm. two years worth of vesting. From year two to year three, you're only increasing your ownership by 50% at that point. And from year three to year four, you're barely increasing your ownership at all, I think by only about 33%, right? So if you, if you graph that, mm -hmm. you're saying, wait, from year one to year two, I'm doubling my value, whatever it is. From year two to year three, I'm only increasing it by 50%. So somewhere probably between year one to year three, you should leave every company from a purely mathematical standpoint. And the assumption is generally that most companies are not going to turn into any value whatsoever. So you should always leave as soon as possible. So the extreme version of pessimism <laughs> is you leave on year one plus one day. And the extreme version of conservatism is you leave somewhere between year two and year three because you've optimized your ownership. If you're a believer in the company, then doubling is still worth something. But only increasing by 50% yeah, right. is not as valuable as diversifying into another company's stock. So if you're the extreme right, you'd mercenary, the years somewhere else. extreme mercenary yeah. is you stay for a year. If you think the company's not full of shit, 
You stay for another year if you think they're actually going to exit because you're going to double your ownership. And even if you're a believer in the company, unless you think they're the next coming of Facebook or NVIDIA, you leave between year two, two and three. So mm -hmm. that's a more important yeah. knowledge, knowledge point than am I working for the right AI company or not? If I were in AI, I'd probably do a two-year tour of duty as many AI companies as possible. <laughs> um, but, you know, probably we're going to hit the singularity before you get too many hands of poker in. So, you know, there's, there's not much more time <laughs> left before we hit the singularity. I don't know if it's 10 years no, or 20 years. Are you a year there or you just give up? You know, we're all out of jobs and dead or all living in utopia in less than 20 years, in my opinion. So it really doesn't fucking matter anymore. Too much. It's like we're all playing I... a game here. Okay, so sweep the leg no mercy, perfect note to end on. <laughs> you two are always invited to come back come back again. Really appreciate it. Any anything you all want to put in, anything you wanna uh, uh talk about quick plug things that you're I think quick plug. Yes, that's uh Yohei Nakajima and Jessica Jackley are running a fund called Untapped VC. For anybody who's interested in AI, uh I think you should give them their your money. Uh you know, full disclosure, I'm a small LP in their fund, but I really think uh Yohei was the author of Baby AGI, which is an open source uh, oh, template wow. for oh, yeah, writing we, autonomous yeah. agents. Uh, he's yeah, fascinating. Yeah, you should get him on your show at some point. But I think he's one of the smartest Can people in AI. Absolutely, sure. Uh, yeah, yeah so that's uh, plug number one. Uh, I don't think we should plug our own shit, but uh, Aman tells me that we're going to be a 506. Oh, go ahead. Come on. C, no, dude, uh, we like organization. you. Practical VC. Go for it. Uh, yeah, so if you want to invest in venture ahead, but don't want to take as much risk and want a shorter turnaround time on your Dave's money, frozen. I'm frozen Dave, here while I'm trying Dave's to just been right. taken out by the lizard people. I got some now. hardware that knows. I got some hardware. Oh, there you go. There you're, back. Back. you're back, Dave. You're He's back. back. Go okay. ahead. Dave, please. So I, I believe I according, to, uh, according to my lawyer, who is my partner here, uh, we are filing as a 506C organization, which means we can talk publicly about our fundraising. Uh, we're raising for our third fund. If you're interested in investing in venture, but want a lower risk and faster return in venture, secondary firms probably have a shorter time horizon for return of capital than traditional venture firms. And given the market conditions we're in right mm -hmm. now, where a lot of people haven't seen liquidity for the last two years, there's a lot of people holding equity, either at the company level or at the fund level who want liquidity. And so we're we're buying those positions, uh, and we have a five year mm -hmm. sort of three to five year window for liquidity for our investments. So we're we're trying to get people money back faster and still have a venture profile investment, but a little bit more diversified mm -hmm. approach. Practical nice. venture nice, capital, perfect. because it isn't. There you go. <laughs> there we go. That, perfect. Logan. All right, y'all. Well, hey, um, if you're watching right now, um, I'm going to link you to Amon's last video where he talks about debt and the economy. It's really good to check it out. Don't forget to like and subscribe. Also, support us on patreon.com forward slash sick. You get our newsletter. You get private access to content, and you can ask, ask our guests questions. So talk to you all later. Peace.